this is a, this is an extraordinary time. Uh, we, as as uh, mentioned before, we have not planned for this to be a, a virtual conference, but it end, ended up that way. And we have seen technology in action uh, this uh, during the last three months. Uh, without technology, uh, we wouldn't have survived uh, the crisis. So thanks to technology, we were able to uh, work uh, and we were able to uh, uh, live our lives. It was different, but uh, understanding technology, managing technology helped us overcome these difficulties. So the, the conference is, as a result, very timely. So uh, similarly, our keynote speech is very timely. Uh, we have Professor Sri Taluri uh, from Michigan State University uh, talking about Managing macro-level supply chain disruptions, lessons from COVID-19. So I'm going to uh, talk uh, briefly about uh, Professor Taluri's background. Uh, he is the Hoagland Metzler Endowed Professor and Professor of Operations and Supply Chain Management at Michigan State University. His research interests are in the areas of supply risk, buyer-supply relationships, and supply contracts, sustainability in supply chains, technology management, and performance evaluations. So he has published in many, many journals, and, and, he, and uh, his, uh, there has been over 10,000 citations to his work. He is also a fellow of Decision Sciences Institute uh, and, and uh, a Fulbright Distinguished Chair in Business and Economics. Uh, and he is also the honorary professorial fellow at the University of Melbourne, Australia. He has received several awards, and he is also uh, has been an editor for many different journals in our field. So uh, without any further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Taluri to present uh, our keynote speech. Thank you so much. Um, uh, first, uh, you know, I would like to welcome all of you to the 2020 TEMS, uh, TEMSCON conference. Uh, I'm Sri Taluri, a faculty in the Department of Supply Chain Management at the Broad College of Business at Michigan State University. Of course, uh, you know, it would have been uh, better to meet all of you in person, but given the situation that we're in currently facing with uh, COVID-19, uh, this is by far our best and the only option to run the conference. And uh, kudos really to uh, Tugrel and uh, the IEEE team for making this happen. It is certainly not an easy task uh, to move the conference online in such a short notice. So my talk is on managing macro level supply chain disruptions with specific emphasis on lessons from COVID-19. Now this area, as Tugrel mentioned, fits well with my research interests in the domain of uh, risk management in supply chains. And some of the work uh, that I'm going to discuss or talk about uh, is going to be focusing on the research that we have done in this domain, both from a strategic and tactical decision-making standpoint in managing and mitigating risk in supply chains. So specifically, I'm going to discuss what supply chain strategies have contributed to the disruption that we're actually facing right now. That is where we are uh, and why we are here. And then move to what strategies to focus on to mitigate the impact of such macro level disruptions uh, moving forward. And given my experience with the online sessions, uh, I will keep the talk short and to the point so that you know, we don't start losing people. So with that, uh, let's jump in into the actual presentation here, which is you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted supply chains in a variety of ways, as we know. So supply disruptions are occurring with respect to raw materials and components, uh, specifically sourced from China. And uh, that is really not surprising given that 70% uh, of global supply of raw materials is controlled by China. 
But we've also seen shortages you know, associated with uh, other items, you know, other products like food and wine products, uh, given what has happened in countries like you know, Italy. Now, we've also felt effects from the demand side across a variety of areas. So, which is what makes this disruption rather unique, that it is you know, simultaneously impacting both supply and uh, demand side. So, for example, decrease in demand for a variety of consumer products, uh, effects in terms of uh, travel, restaurants, right? Uh, because of social distancing and uh, lockdown measures that we're currently experiencing. On the other hand, uh, we've also seen demand spikes and panic buying for items like toilet paper, hand sanitizers, et cetera, right? So overall, uh, if, you, if you see, uh, we've got significant demand vacillations that are occurring across a variety of products and services. So these demand uncertainties have the potential to create what we refer to as bullwhip effects in supply chain, where retailers possibly could overorder certain items, uh, cut down on others, right? And as we know, these vacillations can get magnified as we move from downstream to upstream in a supply chain, uh, which has a variety of implications on costs, capacity, shortages, et cetera. So basically, you know, you've got this perfect storm that is having an impact across a variety of dimensions. Now, in the past, we have experienced other macro-level disruptions as well, you know, such as you know, earthquake and subsequent tsunami in Japan in 2011, uh, which has adversely impacted the, the automotive industry due to the lack of visibility into the higher tiers of their networks. Uh, and also the recession that we faced in 2008. So how is this disruption really different? Okay, what makes this unique? The one thing that I did talk about before was that uh, the simultaneous impact of both supply and demand. But above and beyond that, right, with some of those other events that I talked about uh, or that I referred to, they were mostly focused and isolated. But the current situation that we're facing uh, has impacted uh, many parts of the globe and is actually rather uh, dynamic in nature, right? So it is difficult to predict the progression of this disease and the possible occurrence of a second wave, right? And what the new hotspots are going to actually look like. So I think that is what actually makes this so much more difficult to mitigate. Uh, so in this talk, you know, hopefully, you know, I will try to suggest uh, some potential solutions. But of course, uh, there is no one-size-fits-all kind of a strategy here. And um, we can certainly consider some short-term and long-term ways in which we can reconfigure uh, you know, some of the decisions that we're making in terms of managing these types of disruptions better. So as I mentioned at the outset, uh, we'll be focusing on uh, two specific aspects. First, uh, what really got us here in terms of the current supply chain uh, strategies? And second, uh, what do we have to do moving forward to appease the impact of uh, such a disruption? So issues with uh, current uh, supply chain strategies. Uh, first, uh, as we know, supply chains are complex and geographically dispersed, and there is usually a lack of visibility into higher tiers, which means the focal company certainly has visibility into what's happening with their first tier suppliers, but we are talking about second and you know, higher tiers. So basically, with very little information, on suppliers, suppliers, it becomes difficult to plan for such a disruption. 
Uh, in fact, a recent uh, Institute of Supply Management, Institute for Supply Management study has concluded that more than 50% of companies lack upstream knowledge or visibility. And similar effects were actually felt during the 2011 tsunami in Japan. And in fact, at that time, a report from Toyota basically concluded that uh, before the disruption, they had very little information beyond their first few suppliers. And subsequently, uh, Toyota has made improvements to actually better uh, you know, understand what is going on in the higher tiers uh, to be able to manage their system in a more you know, effective manner. Second, a related aspect is the ripple effect associated with a supply chain disruption. That is, uh, an upstream disruption propagates through the supply chain, affecting many layers, resulting in delays and shortages, which is basically what we are currently you know, experiencing. So for example, a supplier disruption leads to possible production delays, which can in turn lead to transportation delays. Third, emphasis on cost efficiencies in designing, operating, and managing a supply chain. So what I mean by this is the primary factor utilized is cost, where little importance is given to factors above and beyond cost, like responsiveness, right, or resilience. So there's not much slack in the system given this. So in an event such as this, it becomes difficult to look for alternative source of production to be able to manage such an impact. And also, uh, many companies could have better managed the crisis uh, with a more proactive and involved uh, supply chain management approach. But it is that management component which in the larger SEM, which is kind of missing, right? So clearly there is not uh, enough emphasis in terms of thoroughly scrutinizing, measuring, and managing supply chain. So more emphasis is really needed on that management aspect. And finally, uh, the supply chain strategy was primarily short-sighted or myopic, you know, in that the focus is mostly on the focal company with, a, with that low-cost you know, perspective in mind that I was just referring to without taking into consideration end-to-end uh, -end, uh, supply chain you know, perspective. So basically, uh, focusing on local optimization instead of globally optimizing your supply chain and better coordinating it so that the players with the supply chain are actually aligned in terms of their decision making, right? So of course, you know, this is not an exhaustive list by any means, uh, but some of the reasons as to why we are here uh, you know, with respect to the current you know situation that we're actually you know facing. So if we uh, move to potential strategies, so where do we want to go from here? Uh, as discussed, I'm going to address this question both from short term and long term perspectives. First, in looking at the short term, uh, in terms of immediate impact, okay. what do companies have to do? And what are we actually uh, seeing companies do? So I think there needs to be a focus on flexibility-based mitigation strategies. And a perfect example of that actually is, you know, how was this conference organized in such a short time frame to move everything online? And that is, in fact, a flexibility-based strategy. Right. Basically, it refers to the ability to reconfigure the system quickly to meet changing demand. So we will discuss this more in detail later in the talk. 
And from a long-term standpoint, there is a need for more of a balanced approach with both flexibility and redundancy-based mitigation uh, being emphasized on. And in addition, companies ought to focus on uh, understanding their network vulnerabilities better, understanding their network structure, what kind of uh, network structures are actually more robust and resilient to these types of disruptions, and other aspects uh, that we will discuss, such as the emphasis on that um, supply chain visibility that I talked about, and um, you know the overall aspect of uh, risk management culture that has to be in uh, place. So in the short term, right? What are we experiencing right now, given that we do not have required stock levels for a variety of critical items, okay, such as masks, ventilators, PPE, et cetera, I feel that flexibility-based strategies can actually play a very important role here, and they're actually playing a huge role. And obviously, redundancy is really not an option in the short term uh, with the current situation the way it is, because we just don't have the stock levels for some of these items that I was just referring to. Now, some of our own research that was published in 2013 has demonstrated that uh, building flexibility into the system, okay, that is, be able to change production volumes, i.e. volume flexibility or product mix flexibility, and uh, responsiveness you know, in terms of producing faster by minimizing setups, et cetera is in general more efficient than redundancy-based strategies such as holding high stock levels or having alternative sources of uh, supply. And this result was in general uh, consistent under a variety of risk categories, risk sources, and supply chain configuration. So when I say risk categories, right, we are talking about uh, disruptions, which means a supplier can go down, a plant may go down, right? Or delays, which means not being able to uh, get the product on time because of production or transportation issues. And distortion, right? Which is vacillations that you can expect at the uh, customer level. And when we say risk sources, uh, it can be a supplier can be a risk source, or it can be internal to a manufacturing process, or it could actually be customer related. So across a variety of settings, we have demonstrated that these flexibility-based strategies are dominating uh, redundancy-based you know, approaches. So when we talk about flexibility-based mitigation uh, that companies are actually utilizing in the current context, several examples come to mind. Uh, Ford, uh, GM, and Tesla retooling their factories uh, to produce ventilators. Now, retooling obviously requires the system to have high uh, flexibility capability. Also, 3M and GE Healthcare working on uh, production of masks, face shields, other PPE type of equipment for healthcare workers. And likewise, you know, GM working with GE on a simplified ventilator design. So such types of uh, new partnerships and uh, flexible strategies can work in this context and they are actually working. And this actually becomes even more important if a second wave were to occur later in the year. You know, I certainly hope not, but if it does occur, then these are the types of strategies, right? that you can possibly utilize to mitigate you know, that kind of an impact. So another aspect that comes to mind here is that how do you ramp up a production with current social distancing measures in place? And companies are actually doing that. Uh, for example, right, Micron technology, which uh, basically produces uh, computer memory and computer uh, storage systems, is utilizing the concept of cross functional worker teams that operate in different schedules 
so as to minimize the spread of the disease. So as you can see, right, quite a few examples on how this uh, flexibility-based mitigation is being uh, utilized in the current context. So shifting gears, right, to uh, possible long-term strategies uh, that I listed, listed earlier, and they're shown here, the following six can possibly uh, make, a, make an impact. So in the long term, I feel that a balanced approach with focus on both flexibility and redundancy-based mitigation is needed. And as I said earlier, right, there is too much emphasis on cost efficiency in designing, uh, operating, and managing supply chain. So there is not much of slack in the system or emphasis on responsiveness. And by the way, you know, these types of investments in risk mitigation come at a, uh, come at a cost, right? So if you're holding excess stock levels, or if you're focusing on flexible operation, investments have to be made, you know, to be able to achieve excellence across those, um, you know, objectives. So what is critical is to design networks by considering cost versus risk trade-offs, I feel. Some of our work in this area has focused on methods that simultaneously take into consideration both objectives of minimizing costs and maximizing reliability or minimizing risk. In the presence of compounding aspects of risk. So basically dual objectives, right, with compounding aspects of risk. What is this compounding aspect of risk and what does it mean? What it means is that we are not only interested in the inherent risk associated with a specific node in an arc. A node would be a supplier in a network or a plant or a warehouse. An arc would be the transportation route. So we are interested, we are not only interested in that, the inherent risk associated with those nodes and arcs, but we're also interested in the risk of the upstream parts of the network that are linked to that specific node or arc. Because considering those interrelationships is very, very important, given that there is this the ripple effect that I was referring to you know, earlier, which is a disruption happens upstream, right? that's going to propagate through the entire network. So it is not enough for us to just look at what is the risk associated with a specific node and arc, but you have to actually look at what is happening upstream. If something were to fail upstream, how does that have an impact in terms of what is happening downstream? Right. So considering those kinds of trade-offs, okay, to design supply chain network. So without getting into all the mathematics you know, associated with it, okay. I'll just give you the key takeaway of the work, of you know, some of this work that we have done. So if you look at the graph that I have here, uh, we've got cost on the x-axis and reliability on the y-axis. This is by taking those dual objectives into account. First, it is clear the trade-offs between cost and reliability appear here, which means if you want more reliability, it comes at a higher cost. Second, every point on these functions corresponds to a specific network design. I apologize for that. I should have muted my uh, phone. Uh, but yeah, so. If you want more reliability, you know, it comes at a higher cost. 
And second, every point um, you know, on this, you know, on these functions basically corresponds to a specific network design, as I was saying. With the differential emphasis on cost and flexibility. So what do we mean by that? So if the decision maker places a higher weight on cost, then the network will be more streamlined with fewer nodes and fewer arcs. But if there's a higher emphasis on reliability, the network will be more complex. Right? That is, more number of nodes and arcs so that now you possibly can have you know, alternative paths in case of a disruption were to occur. So a redundancy-based um, strategy here might be alternative sources of supply in the network, as I was saying, and a flexibility-based strategy might be to select a plant that is more responsive. But as discussed earlier, right? I mean, these uh, come at a cost. And finally, uh, the importance of uh, considering, you know, this entire issue, right, of ripple effects. So the function at the top of the graph demonstrates the overestimation of reliability if this compounding aspects of risk okay, are not considered or are not taken into account. So this uh, type of analysis you know, emphasizes the need for companies to consider multiple objectives, objectives above and beyond cost in designing and operating networks to improve resilience. So if we move to the next slide here. I went in the opposite direction. So considering uh, the discussion on this balanced approach, right? We are still on that uh, redundancy versus flexibility. How do we decide, right, as to what specific mitigation strategies to use upstream versus downstream within a supply chain? Now, do we have to use these strategies or mitigation strategies that is in isolation? Or somehow, should they be linked? You know, what is the optimal mix of strategies to use? And you know, those are all questions that companies can face. Right? And again, we've done some work in this domain. And our work focuses on suggesting an optimal mix of strategies that companies can utilize. And more importantly, okay, the emphasis on the alignment between upstream and downstream strategies to derive the maximum benefit. So for, for example, right, a buffer inventory upstream, okay, go hand in hand with volume flexibility downstream, right? That goes hand in hand with volume flexibility downstream because you need to have enough capacity to take advantage of the available inventory upstream. So it's just not, you know, uh, trying to implement these mitigation strategies in an ad hoc manner. You're looking at combination of strategies or combinations of strategies that actually work uh, for the entire supply chain. And it's also a resource allocation problem, right? So if you invest X dollars in something, you've got X dollars less to do something else. So in situations like that, how do you optimally invest these resources to be able to achieve you know, the maximum benefit, as I said, you know, in terms of uh, mitigating risk? Vulnerabilities in or understanding vulnerabilities in various parts of your supply network is another important uh, factor that companies ought to consider. So, for example, you know, how does a node's disruption impact the entire network? And that is a question that we want to know. That tells you something about what nodes are critical in the network. Uh, so that we can employ some fortification options, okay, so that we can minimize the disruption, you know, at those specific nodes. And we have done some work in this domain uh, using some Bayesian network models, uh, focusing mostly on, um, you know, automotive networks. And again, you know, I'm not going through go through all the 
the mathematics here, but just to give you some um, quick takeaways. So here we're looking at Honda Center Console Network with a variety of first, second, and higher tier supply. So under certain conditions right, associated with the disruptions and their propagations, that is, what is the uh, disruption probability associated with the node and related uh, transfer probability, which means the node gets disrupted, right? So uh, let me just uh, paraphrase that. So not only the probability that a node gets disrupted, but in the event that a node gets disrupted, how does that impact you know, other nodes in the network, again, because of those ripple effects okay, that I was referring to? So with those assumptions, uh, in this case, the focal companies are Honda's central console network that we're looking at. The, disru the, the, the disruption risk, excuse me, is 8%, uh, what you're seeing on the um, left-hand side here. So we can identify criticality of suppliers based on these two metrics that I'm showing you here. The first metric is, metric is the supplier fortification impact, and the second metric is supplier uh, disruption impact, which is on the right. So fortification impact refers to the decrease in focal company's risk if certain nodes are fortified. Right. So by utilizing, let's say, buffer stock or alternative source of capacity, et cetera, right? So for example, here, if we were to take, if you we were to fortify CVT assembly, which is that big node at the center, right, the first year supplier to Honda, then the focal company's risk decreases by 5.4%. That is, it drops from 8% to 2.6% if you we were to fortify CVT assembly. So that's one side of the coin, right? Whereas if you look at disruption impact measure on the right side, that basically is, it demonstrates the increase in focal company's risk if the supplier is disrupted for sure. And so if CVT assembly were to be disrupted for sure, uh, then in this case, right, the focal company's risk is going to increase by 43.3%. So the overall risk goes up from 8% to 51.3%. So just to kind of understand, right, the criticality associated with various nodes in your network, and later on, I'll actually show you how you can possibly utilize this to rationalize your supply base. And some of the other results here that we have found are that suppliers that are closer to focal companies in general uh, pose greater risks. High degree centrality associated with the node indicates uh, criticality due to the sheer number of connections that a specific node uh, has. So then how do, so how do we take this information that we have here okay, and focus on coming up with a, a possible rationalization scheme? So in terms of jointly using the supplier fortification and supplier disruption, uh, mainly from a supplier rationalization standpoint, uh, this two by two grid here can help us. So if you look at the um, this two by two, I've got supplier fortification scores on the you know x-axis, right, and they've got supplier disruption you know uh, scores on the y-axis. So on the top right-hand corner, uh, we have the most critical suppliers, given that both their fortification and disruption impacts are high. So it is important to prevent disruptions here 
and focus on certain resource allocation strategies, such as either backup supply or you want to redesign the network so that you're not heavily dependent on these types of suppliers. At the bottom left-hand corner, both impacts are low. So they are non-critical suppliers. And if you look at the off-diagonal, yeah, those are candidates possibly for some improvement. Right? If you look at the bottom right-hand corner, um, well, the supplier is a significant contributor to the overall risk. The system can manage the disruption without major problems. So a possible candidate for reliability improvement in that kind of a setting. And finally, if you go to the uh, top left-hand corner, a supplier is not a big contributor to overall risk, but disruption can have um, severe implications. So maybe we should consider a backup supply option here. So moving forward, right, these types of models can help companies better manage their supply chains, right, by focusing on those uh, weaker links in the system. How do you... Uh, the idea is to improve the resilience associated with your network. Uh, another aspect okay, uh, that is uh, critical uh, here in the long run is to investigate the uh, uh, topology of network. That is, what types of network configurations are robust and resilient? Now, literature has demonstrated that there are a variety of factors that, that play an important role here. I've listed these factors here. <clears throat> Our density, which basically relates to geographical dispersion of your network. Complexity, which is number of nodes and arcs in the network. Uh, node criticality that I already talked about in terms of the supplier disruption impact and supplier fortification impact, right? So again, you know, without going into all the details, what we have found uh, through our research is that while complex networks have a higher probability of getting disrupted, complex networks meaning with more number of nodes and arcs, right? While the probability of those types of networks getting disrupted is, is higher, they're able to rebound quicker given that they're less dependent on individual suppliers, uh, possibly because they have dual sourcing options or backup supply and you know, whatever the case may be. And which is not the case with more streamlined networks. There, there are fewer suppliers, perhaps more deep and collaborative partnerships that exist there. Okay. So while streamlined networks have a lower probability of getting disrupted, once they get disrupted, they're unable to recover quickly or in an in a efficient manner. So actually, this is an interesting uh, finding because uh, uh, from a GIT standpoint, right, you would always try to push for a uh, few reliable suppliers and long-term partnerships with these suppliers. Um, so what we're saying here is that while that is important for companies to do, it is also important to plan for redundancy in the system. Right? You know, disruption happens, and you should have alternative paths, you know, to be able to uh, get the product to the customer. So as I said before, you know, improving supply chain visibility. Right? I gave you quite examples in terms of Toyota and other uh, companies, you know, that that are actually trying to do this to a <coughs> excuse me higher extent now. This is where supplier relationships are critical to better understand, right? How recovery is unfolding upstream in the event that there is a disruption, and how do you plan and respond? Uh, better. <clears throat> 
So this is where some uh, the use of some incentive mechanisms, such as profit sharing, supply chain contracts, and significant work is done in that domain to better coordinate the system to facilitate that information exchange that can help in this process. So some of our work again here has demonstrated the use of uh, information sharing mechanisms to better coordinate the system in planning for in inventories at various locations within the supply chain in the event a disruption were to occur, given the disruption probabilities associated with various uh, uh, players within the network. How do you come up with a some sort of a mechanism you know, that would be able to provide you with some answers with respect to, you know, this happens, you know, how do we react? And better understand really the behavior of various players in the supply chain um, and to coordinate some of those actions that these players are actually uh, making. So if somebody is focusing on a myopic type of a decision that locally optimizes their uh, process without actually looking at what is happening to other parts of the network, uh, then these types of you know, incentive mechanisms can uh, overcome you know, those types of uh, suboptimal policies that various uh, uh, supply chain members can possibly use. So with that, let's also let's move to you know my my last uh, um, long term strategy here. The importance of fostering a risk management culture okay? that is not in terms of what you're doing internally, but also kind of. What, how we are dealing with your suppliers, how we are dealing with your customers. So having that risk management uh, culture in place. In terms of incorporating, as I said, risk-based metrics into various decisions like supplier selection, supply-based optimization type of uh, decisions and some of the work that we've done here, in fact, which was uh, which appeared in IEEE transactions where we looked at uh, supplier selection decisions focusing on multi-dimensional aspects of risk. By taking, I mean, risk is a very complex construct. There's multiple dimensions that are embedded in it. So how do you evaluate suppliers and rationalize your supply base by taking those multiple aspects of risk? For example, failures in quality failures in cost management systems, failures in uh, delivery, failures in flexibility. And those are all different and possible dimensions. So how do you take those uh, multiple dimensions and aggregate them into uh, some meaningful indices so that uh, a company can make a better decision in terms of uh, selecting suppliers that are able to uh, respond okay, in situations where there is uh, you know, the possibility of these types of uh, disruptions. Right? Also, supply rationalization aspects, uh, understanding which suppliers you should form long-term partnerships with, which suppliers are possible candidates for supplier development, uh, which suppliers you possibly have to uh, prune from the system. Actually, these are all uh, you know, different decisions that companies uh, can go through uh, under this broad rubric of uh, risk, risk management. In addition, I think it is important to rethink global sourcing and uh, offshoring decisions. The over-dependence on few suppliers, that is what we're experiencing, which has resulted in the situation where we are now. So moving forward, maybe a more tailored approach, okay? a combination of uh, sourcing global sourcing and also maybe bringing some of the production 
uh, you know, back into the U.S. So reshoring could be a possible uh, option that we have to consider uh, moving you know, forward. So in terms of key takeaways, you know, what 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 did we uh, really stress on in this talk here? Given the situation that we are in currently, I think, as I said, flexibility in the short run to address this problem is very, very important. And then emphasis on both flexibility and redundancy in the long run. So building some of that uh, slack into the system. And a robust and resilient network design with cost and risk considerations, uh, incorporating those trade-offs, and within that context, you know, focusing on uh, criticality of suppliers and coming up with optimal resource allocation strategies in terms of you know, fortification and so on, right? And focusing on those, you know, uh, network structures. And finally, of course, we talked about uh, the risk management culture, which is really you know, important in this context as well. So that pretty much summarizes you know, everything that we discussed today. And uh, I'd be happy to take any questions that, uh, that you may have. Thank you so much, Siri. Uh, Thank so, you. Uh, I'm gonna let Vishwas see if there are any questions. Okay, thank you, Tabul. I do not see any questions so far. Uh, dear attendees, uh, if you have any questions or any comments, uh, feel free to ask either on the chat channel or the Q&A section, or uh, raise your hand. I can uh, um, unmute you so that you can interact with Sri, whichever way is comfortable. I have a question while we wait for the other sure. questions. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, we, we have lived through interesting times, and, and uh, you basically went through the, uh, the details of those. But going into the future, based on your experience, uh, how do you think the supply chain networks will evolve? For example, obviously, we were extremely dependent on China. Uh, and do we expect now companies to be more locally sourced at uh, different locations to avoid a situation like that in the future? Yeah, that's that's an excellent question, and I think we kind of uh, touched on that a little bit. I think uh, a combination, uh, because there is a cost benefit in terms of uh, sourcing from some of these countries where you know, you can certainly cut down costs, but at the same time, you know, that is coming at the expense of risk. So I think, um, I mean, either strategy towards their extremes is not good. You certainly don't want to uh, over dependence on a few suppliers because of uh, cost, cost considerations. That is certainly not a good strategy to use. On the other hand, you, know, you just don't want to completely avoid that and bring everything in-house, uh, which is going to increase costs uh, tremendously. Right? So having some sort of a tailored approach, which is a combination of the two, right? uh, by considering those, and I think that's what we mean by you know, looking at those trade-offs and designing your networks so that in the event something like this happens, you know, there is uh, a possibility of a uh, backup you know, supply that is you know, available. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, are there any other questions? So, Sri, uh, I really thank you. This has been a very interesting look at the technicalities, details of what we lived through. This was a very timely presentation. Uh, and thank you for uh, joining us.
uh, during these difficult days. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Now, uh, this, uh, Shri, there is a question. Sorry, this is Vishwas. Uh, there is a question uh, from one of our attendees. Uh, the question is, on the supply network topic, can you give some more detail on the relationship between the re resilience and the complexity of the network? Was there a break point where too complex was not beneficial? Yeah, that's an excellent point. You know, I think, uh, so what we have found, let me just, uh, you know, reiterate what we found and then I'll answer the specific question. Um, so what we found is that in a complex network, right, uh, the probability of uh, either a node or an R getting disrupted is certainly high. But when the disruption actually occurs, right, in complex networks, it is much easier to rebound, right? Because you've got possibly some alternative sources of supply or you know, inventories, you know, whatever the case may be. Whereas in a streamlined network, that is certainly not the case. But the question is, you know, is too much network complexity bad for you? So is there some sort of a you know, inverted U-shaped function where there's an optimal level of complexity? We have not. Uh, looked into that, but I think it's a very interesting question to look at, and I certainly think that there will be some sort of a um, point, an optimal point, where if you go above and beyond that, you're actually uh, losing out. That is because, right, the more complex the networks are, okay, the higher the cost is going to be. A cost not in just terms of in operating the network, Okay, in coordination and all these different things, right? So clearly, above and beyond certain point, okay, it would be difficult to manage those types of networks. Uh, but to your question, to your specific question, in terms of have we looked at it, uh, we've not looked at it, you know, in this uh, specific context, but that's something you know, that would be very interesting to look at. Thank you, Sri. Uh, 